Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ray. I am a detransitioned male, and today I'm going to be reacting to Judith Butler, the queen of gender ideology herself, doing an interview about her new book, Who's Afraid of Gender? And the question that I want to dig into is the uh, interviewer asked about uh, going back to Butler's earlier work, um, Gender Trouble, etc., where she basically makes this famous social constructivist claim that the sex gender distinction is basically uh, fuzzy or vague or, or essentially socially constructed such that sex is just as much socially constructed as gender. So traditionally, the sort of like um, folk psychological basic common sense view is that there's that sex is mind independent, objective biological fact, and gender, all the cultural signifiers associated with um, that objective biological fact of the male female sexual dimorphism is basically socially constructed to some degree or another. For example, you know, boys uh, like blue and girls like pink, etc. Um, but Butler famously claims that the sexual part, the sex part, the male female part, that also is socially constructed. And so a lot of her critics have said that, oh, well, she's denying the materiality of the body. She's like denying the reality of male and female. She, she's trying to erase the differences between male and female. And um, so Butler, you know, is like uh, unpersuaded by these criticisms and has maintained this stance all these years that sex is um, socially constructed just as much as, um, you know, gender. And this has been incredibly influential on the trans activist movement, the trans ideological movement, which has basically tried to pull a fast one over us as a, a society to gaslight us into thinking that we don't know what males are, we don't know what females are, and that the only reason why we categorize the world into males and females is because we're somehow, you know, just Western, racist, European colonialists who imposed that male female. Um, categorization schema onto basically a fuzzy category <laughs> in order to, you know, uh, enact some sort of like, you know, hegemonic, like cultural power dynamic of like, you know, sexism and racism and transphobia and homophobia and all this stuff. Um, so I'm going to react to this clip and break it down philosophically, explain the logic of where it goes wrong and basically show that, you know, Butler is just completely lost in the clouds with this social constructivist nonsense and has no grounding in the evolutionary biological reality of the male-female sexual dimorphism that connects us to the animal kingdom and provides an empirical, objective um, grounding for the reality of our embodied experience as males or females. Okay, let's watch the video. And by the way, um, I sped the clip up to 1.25. So if it sounds a little funny, that is why. Okay, let's go. So I imagine that, um, you know, some of your academic readers who come to this book will hear echoes of your early work in it. And one, I mean, one argument that has been really central to the anti-gender movement is the argument that you made in really in gender trouble that sex is a result of a gender ideology as opposed to sex giving us a foundation for gender. So you reverse the order of the relationship between the body and ideology. And that's the piece that the right-wing Christians in, in particular, but also the TERFs, you know, are really fixated on because they not just terse, um, evolutionary biologists, um, common people with common sense, it, it, anyone who has eyeballs who can just observe the reality of the differences between males and females, who knows that, you know, females give birth to babies and males are the ones who impregnate females. And the fact that this is just like seen all across the animal kingdom and that, you know, we widely recognize that that male, female sexual dimorphism is just a basic evolution. Fact. Oh, just, yeah. Well, well, we'll just forget all about that. It's, it's just those crazy turfs, those crazy right wingers, you know, they're the only ones who think that sex is real. <laughs> Okay, let, let's keep going. Want to insist that there is a body, that the body has a real form, yeah, and that gender ideology is a distortion of that form. So it's to me, it was really fascinating to see you go back um, to you know what, what began it all in some ways to gender trouble. 
Well, I went back to Sherry Ortner. You know, yeah, I went back to you, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I went way back to the sex gender distinction and the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and how? I mean, what what do you think about that? The fact that thirty years later, you, we kind of have to have the same <laughs> argument, and you still you have to go into a different registry and make that argument again. Only there are more there are more people who are opposed to it now, and in fact, it's not. It's the turfs. It's the anti gender people. It's the right wingers. But even there are some trans theorists who want to say, but Judith Butler, there is a material body. Why are you telling us that everything is created through gender ideology? Oh, well, I mean, I would never, yes, of course. I mean, they would use the term gender ideology against me or attribute it to me, I suppose. Um, scary that feminists would use that term though when they see Viktor Orban and Putin and all these um, uh, intense right-wing anti-feminist authoritarians um, proliferating that. and. And including feminism in it, you know. Yeah. I mean, they're all anti-feminists. They all want women back in the in the householder. They want to preserve a um, not just a binary but a hierarchy. They want sexuality to become exclusively reproductive or mainly so. I mean, there are many things going on here that are profoundly anti-feminist. So they're also included as targets of the anti-gender ideology movement, even as they use the language. So that's painful and vexing. And how to speak with them is is not easy. Um, but look, um, I mean, I think that there are at least two points that I would make about the so-called materiality of the body. I, it's almost like a... Notice she says the so-called materiality. It's not that the materiality of the male-female sexual dimorphism is an objective biological fact that's mind-independent, that exists you know, in the animal kingdom, and you know, it's just a basic fact of reality. No, it's so-called, the so-called materiality. A joke. It I mean, really is. Um, like that was bodies that matter was already the response. But you see, right. then they would say, see, how we're and Butler are joking. They don't take it seriously. Okay, but here, um uh okay. Um I mean if we just start with sex assignment, right? Like as John Money did, it's like, all right, people are making decisions about how to assign sex. Sex is not just there, it's observed, you know. Sometimes what is observed is complex and not immediately available to binary assignments um, or you make an assignment and then there's a question of somebody living with that assignment and they when they start to speak and talk and live their lives they can very well speak up and say you know what wrong assignment this is not the one i want i'm actually going to assign myself so okay so notice that this is quintessential to understanding the social constructivist gender ide ideological queer theoretical framework of these people like judith butler and this whole apparatus tracing back to the postmodern, post-structuralist tradition in the philosophy you know movement people like michelle foucault and all these constructivists like derrida and 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 people who for them it's all about discourse it's about language it's about the realm of culture and you know the, the human world of culture and signs and symbols and words and discourse and narrative that is where they live that for them that is reality they live in a linguistic bubble what michel foucault called the episteme it is the sort of linguistic horizon through which we view everything um and i'm not saying that that doesn't exist like they're definitely like we like as linguistic creatures, as cultural creatures, we definitely do live in a matrix of signs and symbols that are created from language. But we cannot start an analysis of the materiality of the body, of the materiality of the male-female sexual dimorphic um, distinction. We cannot start with assignment in a hospital room um, and what is assignment? Assignment is documentation onto a piece of paper for a legal purpose to document male or female. But the fact that when asked a question about the materiality of the body, Judith Butler immediately starts thinking about this cultural, linguistic, legal, social process of assignment, which is a fundamentally cultural um, linguistic phenomenon. Does she start? with evolutionary history? Does she start with the fact that humans are animals? Does she start with not the assignment of the 
of you know the the baby's sex on a piece of paper in a hospital for legal insurance purposes or for you know documentation in like the government registry of citizens or whatever uh like why don't you start in the material fact of like who is giving birth to the baby it's a woman it's a female and who impregnated that female a male via sperm you have this distinction between those who create sperm and those who create eggs and you put them two together and you have a baby and that is how sex works that is an objective biological fact it is an evolved adaptive reproductive strategy that has evolved over the past you know i don't know billions of years um and this is hardwired into our reality as embodied animals and you see this all across the animal kingdom. You see the fact that there is, you know, eggs and sperm, eggs and sperm. You see that pattern all over the animal kingdom. Why? Because that is the fundamental evolutionary reproductive strategy that that is an adaptive mechanism for propagating our genetic material. And that creates sexual dimorphism such that the creatures whose bodies are organized around the developmental pathway, which creates the production of sperm, small gametes, those bodies and those behaviors of those male animals are different than the bodies and behaviors of the organisms whose bodies go down a developmental pathway that's organized, organized around the production of eggs. You see this sexual dimorphism. It's all over the animal kingdom. It is why we have the, the very concept of male and female. Like, like, where did this idea of sex assignment comes from? She's talking about like, you know, the 1970s hospital room as if like that is where the human species um, started. You know, go back 3 million years when the humans were living in the fucking trees, we weren't doing sex assignment in a hospital room. We were having sex as males and females and sexual dimorphism. That is the basis of the reality of the sex, um, <laughs> you know, like differences. That is the basis for the materiality of the body. It is an evolutionary thing. But these feminists like her, they don't talk about evolution. They don't talk about evolutionary psychology. They don't talk about, you know, reproductive strategies and, and like the, you know, they like don't think of, of humans as animals. They think of all they think about is discourse and language and signs and symbols and culture. That is all they think about. They can't, they, they just fundamentally are not educated in the biological sciences and they're and to the extent they have read about evolution they sort of think it may apply to like you know the animal kingdom but somehow when you get to humans we're we're we're, we're, we're like suddenly no longer animals you cannot start your analysis of the understanding of the materiality of sex in a fucking hospital room in the 1970s talking about John Money, a sexologist who is the founder of gender ideology. <laughs> I mean, this is like so bonkers um, that, that, that that is where you would start your analysis. It's crazy. Well, when we think about that act of sex assignment, of course, it's, it's material. I mean, it's a social act. I mean, if we're going to remember Marx, that's a material practice. Uh, sex assignment it happens in institutions um, by authorized individuals according to legal documents, which as we know are sometimes contradictory, as, as Paisley Kura has, has pointed out, depending on which legal regime you're in, your sex is going to be assigned differently, and maybe even in a contradictory fashion, um, which is which is most interesting. Um, so sex assignment is a moment of social power. It's a moment of classificatory power. Um, it doesn't decide once and for all, you know, how best to name that body. It is a provisional assignment that is taken up over time, is lived out, or it is fa fails to be lived out. Notice it's about naming the body. Again, it's about language, narratives, discourse, signs and symbols, signifiers. It's all about, that is all she thinks about. Like for her, male and female is about what do we call males and females? Like what language do we use to describe reality? But they are fundamentally stuck in the world of like description, like, like all they care about is like the signs and the symbols that we use to categorize reality. 
they don't think about reality as independent of language. They don't think about reality as independent of, you know, the, 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 the sort of culture and, and, and the language. And, you know, yes, does language and culture have an impact on our lives? Absolutely. We are cultural creatures. We are linguistic creatures. We, our consciousness is constructed out of, you know, signs and symbols and narratives and all this stuff. We, 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 we are fundamentally encultured creatures who are, you know, linguistic to our core. But that does not negate the fact that we are at a deeper level animals and we are sexually dimorphic as a species. We are a sexually dimorphic species. And what is the nature of sex when we're talking about sexual dimorphism? Like it is the fact that <laughs> there are uh, sperm and egg. And, 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 and there's not a third gamete. There is not a third evolutionary strategy alongside males and females. Now, Judith Butler is, talks about how, oh, well, depending on different legal regimes, you know, the sex assignment could go differently. Like, you know, in like one country, if you have like a super small micro penis and you'll be assigned a female or if you have a, this one particular disorder of, se of sexual dis development in like one country, this disorder of sexual development will be called male. And in like another country, this disorder of sexual development will be called female. So therefore, you know, it's all arbitrary and it's all, you know, cultural and, there, and there's no basis for this. And like, there's no reality to this. Like, no, th this is confused. <laughs> the, the, the mere fact that there are disorders of sexual development in is not evidence against the reality of the sexual dimorphism of the human species between males and females. In the vast, vast majority of cases, 99.99% of all cases of disorders of sexual development can be very clearly and unambiguously demarcated into the male developmental pathway or the female developmental pathway when we understand male and female to have to do with the production of gametes, sperm or egg. How are our bodies organized around the development of the production of egg and sperm? And there are only very, very few cases, like, like I said, 0.01%, vanishingly small, um, of cases where that sort of determination in regards to on the gamete account, the sperm egg account of what sex is, um, where it's not like perfectly, absolutely 100% clear cut in regards to whether you're male or female. But it also doesn't say that there's like an infinite spectrum or that there's five genders, six genders, 10 genders, 15 genders. You know, in those cases, you would just say that that person, that 0.01%, you know, is like both male and female. But that still depends on the sex binary between male and female, because it's just like you have both sets of uh, of tissue. You have ova tissue and testes tissue. Um, but that is extremely rare, and extremely extremely rare. And in 99.99 percent of cases, it is absolutely unambiguous whether or not you are a male or female according to the gamete account, the egg sperm account of what sex is, and that is the account that evolutionary biologists use to explain where did sex come from you know if you go back billions of years ago we were you know like multi we were just like cellular organisms asexually reproducing where did sex come from what is sex what is sex <laughs> that's not even a question they're asking because they don't think in evolutionary terms they don't think in biological terms all they think about is signs and symbols and assignments and narratives and, you know, like, how do we name things? But that is not where reality is about. While, yes, signs and cultures and language do have a reality of their own, it is a superstructure upon the basic sexual dimorphism of the reality of the human species. So this whole, this, and, and, and this perspective that she's articulating has been so influential to confuse everyone in our discourse, and it has provided ample fuel to the fire of gender identity ideology, which has somehow, you know, confused us such that we now think that if a male, um, you know, cuts off their testicles, somehow they're female. 
Um, or that vice versa, if a, you know, if, if a female slices off her breast, that, that somehow makes her male. No, this is just a confused way of thinking about things. And this, this focus on signifiers and signs and cultures and language and naming and assignment, it is just, uh, it is just wrong headed. It, and, and, and it has provided the theoretical justification for the entire apparatus of the trans ideological movement. So this is incredibly important to understand exactly why Butler is wrong on this account, that, that this is just philosophically confused. It is just a, it is just a, it's just bad philosophy. That's all it is, but it's not like you can like, prove it wrong like it's it's not it's it's like not like we're debating like facts or whatever like this is like a a a like matter of like interpretive paradigm shift like she is just operating in a different philosophical paradigm and that philosophical paradigm is immune to the interjection of objective biological reality because because it lives in the world of narrative and discourse and sign. And once you're in that world, and, and if that's the only world you care about, then evolutionary biology and all this stuff, like it just doesn't matter. It, it, it just doesn't factor into your philosophical paradigm. And bodies just become, you know, these gender neutral blobs of flesh that have no, you know, reality as male or female. Male and female just becomes arbitrary. It's just like, oh, like, you know, in one country, males mean this, and another country, males mean this, and like one hospital, male means this, and another hospital, female means that, and it's all arbitrary, it's all cultural, and it's just those crazy Europeans, it's just those the, the, those colonizers, you know, it's just like this, just like a white people thing, you know, transphobes and homophobes, and right wingers and fascists, you know, it, it's just like I don't know, it's like so confused. Okay, <laughs> so I hope you got the point. Um, she doesn't say anything else, you know, that's worth noting on. It's all once you get the point, it's like it you, you just quickly see where the flaw in, in, in her logic is and like what's the problem with this philosophy, with this worldview. Because this is a worldview, it, it is a religion, it, it is a gender religion, it is a it is a philosophical paradigm, it is a worldview, it is a way of viewing the world. Um, so we, we like have to attack it at that level, at, at the level of ideology, at the level of philosophy, at the level of worldview. We, and we have to interject a new worldview that is based on mind independent epistemology. That is based on the idea that facts don't care about your signs and symbols. The facts of the male, female sexual dimorphism is an independent fact that is sort of that that it does not matter what signs and symbols we apply to it. I don't care what sign or symbol you assign to a male who's gone through puberty. That male has, on average, a phil a physiological advantage <coughs> relative to females. That's just a fact. It's mind independent. No signs or symbols or discourses are going to change that. It's just how it is. That's just reality. We need to accept that. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm like worked up over this now. So, okay, um, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.